serious business. 11 o'clock at night. Um, my name is Monique van Dusseldorp. I'm actually the program director for the speakers of Campus Party. And right now I'm just filling in as a temporary moderator. And this is Wienke, who has done something incredible in a very short time. You're conquering the world, right? Yes, you are. Um, Thank you very much. With the Internet of Things, you know, the Things Network. And we all, you all know exactly what we're talking about. It. What can you do with this Things Network? Wienke has just, well, you tell yourself, but you've gathered people all across the globe to connect their cities with Internet of Things networks. Wienke, tell us the big story. Yes, thank you very much. And thanks for, uh, for being here. Um, my name is Wienke Gisselman. I'm going to tell you a story how we build an Internet of Things data network for the city of Amsterdam in six weeks and how we now, within six months, are uh, building Internet of Things uh, data networks in 200 cities around the world. Um, just a little introduction about myself. Uh, I have a corporate background, worked at a telco, uh, started my own company in 2012. Uh, it was a video on a month uh, company. We created a, art uh, a Netflix for Art House. Uh, I sold it to a publisher, in, in, uh, a Dutch publisher, end of 2014. And then uh, I was, was, was looking for my next startup. Uh, I had all the time uh, uh, and, and I was look, looking, looking for something exciting. And then I was, was searching for the new, like, big things. I was looking into artificial intelligence, big data, uh, chatbots, bots, you name it. And of course, also Internet of Things. And um, um, when I was thinking about Internet of Things, I was, I was thinking about a concept it was already uh, available for so long, and it was all these promises of connected devices that are going to make our world better. But if you look at these, that's, I mean, we were promised uh, a smart fridge like 15 years ago. Nobody has a smart fridge. And it really felt like Internet of Things was just a label, uh, like a hype label that was just like st that, that we stick sticked on everything. And it was more like s building gadgets and putting smart in front of objects, like for instance, a smart fork, a smart cup, smart toothbrush, smart egg tray. Okay, what's that? These guys went bankrupt two months ago, so we won't hear from them again. Uh, and uh, this is really some interesting example I like. This is an alarm, and it goes off if your favorite uh, American football team scores a touchdown. So I was like, okay, that's something new, right? A new way of presenting content in a in a in a new way but if you look at where we, well, we have this this whole label of internet of things we've been sticking it on actually still internet of humans like this is an apple watch like people call wearables internet of things it's not a thing it's just an extension of my iphone screen it's still a computer human interface it's not really an autonomous thing that's connected to the internet it's not really the internet of things and um, if you look at the technologies underlying the all these gadgets this wi-fi 3g bluetooth and they're they're all made for computer human interface extensions so a 3g is made for your mobile phone wi-fi is for your ipad so you can stream 4k netflix and bluetooth is made for wearables all extending interfaces to our phone that's not internet of things so what is Internet of Things and why is it not there? Because we were missing a technology, a technology to connect things to the Internet without making these things useless because we connect them to the Internet. So the first thing we did already years ago is that we unleashed them from the power cable because we gave them a battery. And second, what we did is we made radio frequency technologies. but. If you want to, for instance, make add, uh, uh, connect a chair to the internet or a garbage can, you really want a, a, a technology that's really low power because you don't want to bother that chair with charging it every night, beca only because you want to know if somebody sits on there. Yeah? That's why the people from LoRa, from Semtech, invented LoRa and LoRa One. It's a technology that allows you to connect things to the internet that are far away from an internet connection. This is a gateway that connects, connects LoRa 1 devices 
It connects devices, uh, uh, devices that are uh, 10 kilometers away. And the power consumption is really low because the bandwidth is really low and you can, like, uh, for instance, if you want to connect this chair to the internet, you can uh, put a sensor in it and that sensor will last for three years on one battery. So now this technology enables you to connect things to the internet without the things, without bothering the things to be what they are, like a chair or a garbage can or something else. So um, I saw this technology. So a gateway, a Wi-Fi router, it can connect things to the internet with a range of 10 kilometers and these things can last for three years on a battery. So I was like, if I have one gateway and if I have a, have a, a range of 10 kilometers and I have a circle with a radius of 10 kilometers of coverage, right? So I saw this technology and I thought, why don't we uh, just place 10 of these gateways in the city of Amsterdam and then we have the whole city covered. So I was just playing around with this idea, I just sold my previous company and said, how can we do this? Should I make a company out of this? And, and this technology is just, I, will, I couldn't sleep. I think th this is a new type of way of connecting something to the internet this should be something uh, revolutionary. So 10 kilometers range, a lot of devices you can then connect to it. It's very low bandwidth. Everybody can use it because the bandwidth and the spectrum uses is free. So you don't need any licenses as a big telco do, do, do. And actually this the cost of this building this network is very low. It's only a thousand euros. So I said, okay, if you need 10 gateways for Amsterdam and it costs a thousand euros each, then it's only 10,000 euros. Um, Maybe it feels like a lot of money as a maker or as, as, a, as a creator, but if you're in from the telco business, this is really just really nothing. Um, so I thought, okay, how should I do this? Should I make a business out of it? Should I, should I just buy 10 of these gateways and make a l little Internet of Things ISP for the city of Amsterdam? And then I thought, okay, I can do that, but there will be competitors and it will be better to have more money probably not, 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 it's not going to be the best uh, model. So I thought, okay, how did we create the internet? And the internet was created by local private networks, the military, the universities, the government, initial large companies, and they made these private networks. And then they decided, let's connect these networks together, and then we create the internet. And the beautiful, beautiful thing about that is that once they just connected th their own networks, nobody owned the network because there was just one synergy model that created this internet. It was a distributed model when it was born. So there was no single owner, no single party that had the control, no single part or party that could break the network. So it was very resilient and it was really, really scalable because it's distributed and decentralized. So I thought, why don't we build this Internet of Things the same way? So what we'll do is we'll ask people in the city of Amsterdam to buy these gateways, to build their local networks, their local Internet of Things networks, and then we'll make open source software so these gateways can work together as one big mobile network for things. So just crazy idea. So. I pitched it to a good friend of mine, an uh, internet entrepreneur from Amsterdam as well, Johan Stocking, and uh, he, he is also a very good programmer. And I thought, is, is, this, is this possible? Can we technically do this? I gave him the specifications of this, this LoRaWAN technology. Can we make like this internet of things just like the internet is? And he said, yes, we can do that. So um, what, we, what I did, I, m I went to the makerspace in Amsterdam at the... Uh, uh, it, 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 it's once a month, it's called the Amsterdam IoT Meetup. And, and I just did the pitch there. It was, I think, twice, twice the people are here, something like that. And uh, what I said is our mission is to build a decentralized, open and crowdsourced Internet of Things data network owned and operated by its users. And um, 10 of the people there, programmers, uh, said to me, cool, we're going to do that. And one day later, we were in a room, and we were making these feasibility studies about okay, how should we program this? And it was it was really awesome. So it was June last year. So for the freelancers, they were not having any, anything jobs, uh, any jobs for the 
for the summer and the students also not. So, so it was really cool. So we had, had, a, um, had a police agent, we had a physics professor, this was a student who didn't know what he wanted to do. Uh, we, had a, we had a chemistry professor as well. And there was Johan uh, and I, Johan was at that moment in Barcelona. So we were making these plans. We're gonna build an internet of things, data network owned and operated by its users for Amsterdam in six weeks. So the very technical story, right? So we have this, this is just technology push, very abstract, uh, but we needed to find businesses in Amsterdam that, that would be able to understand this. Now you as a maker probably know what I'm talking about, but we needed to find 10 people that want to invest a thousand euro each in a gateway to make this work. So we needed to come up with a use case. So how we're gonna create value on top of this network. And uh, what we did is we made a very typical Amsterdam use case. We made a water sensor that you could put in your boat in Amsterdam. And when the boat catches water, which it always does because it somehow leaks or it rains, then the sensor would detect it. The application would send the owner an SMS. And if the owner would send back respond to that SMS with clear my boat, a surface comes by with a boat and pumps the water out of your boat. So this was really, like, they did with this really resonated well when I told, told the story to all business people that I, I pitched this idea to. And, it, and it's int it resonated well because it places IoT where it is. It places it as a IoT not as a goal, but as a means to gather data to create a disruptive business model to do something disruptive in a market. And maybe this is not the most groundbreaking example, but it, it what it does, it, it extends your senses. With a sensor, you have the information of something happening in your boat. With that information, you can prevent your boat from sinking, and then you can go to your boat yourself where you can feed that data in the only month economy and make sure that uh, that the problem is solved for you, for you by a surface. So it, it really is a, it's a puzzle piece in a larger solution. And it's not a, th a, a thing as is, as this Apple Watch, which is, I can tell you all about it, how useless it is, but it's not a thing in itself. And that's, uh, I think that's, that's for IIT very important. So uh, I told the story within two weeks, I had these companies convinced to, uh, to pledge for a gateway. And the interesting w thing was it's not only startups or people that wanna had the, they're like in the new world, but also corporates like KPMG or Deloitte, or even the port of Amsterdam, which you would expect to partner with a larger corporation or with a telco, they were also very interested. So within six weeks, this was the network we launched. We launched it at, our, uh, at my office. It's a startup space called Rockstart in Amsterdam. This is our uh, very nice conference hall. It uh, was 200 people, entrepreneurs, uh, makers, media, all kinds of people. And we had a whole conference with a hackathon. It was very, very nice. And what we did is uh, we created a little video about what we have accomplished in Amsterdam, and we showed that to the world. People and free and open for everyone to use. That's our mission at the Things Network. We are a group of people that is building a global, crowdsourced, open, free Internet of Things data network. New technologies allow for things to connect to the Internet without Bluetooth, 3G or Wi-Fi. This technology is called LoRaWAN. It's very battery efficient, so devices can last up to three years. It's long range, it has a reach of around 10 kilometers, and it's low bandwidth, ideal for the Internet of Things. The good thing is that this network can be built at a fraction of the cost of traditional mobile data networks. The bandwidth used by LoRaWAN is open and the network equipment is low cost. In the old world, building such a network was up to large corporations. We built the network ground up, funded by its users. So with a small group of people, it's possible to provide data connectivity for an entire city. It's our mission to support that globally. The city of Amsterdam was covered in four weeks and use cases were built on top of that starting from the first day. We believe the abundance in Internet of Things data connectivity we're providing result in exponential innovation in the Internet of Things. You are the network, let's build this thing together. So 
were we told to, uh, the, the worldwide IoT community, you are the network, let's build this thing together. And um, we had a lot of media attention, we were a lot of blogs, but where it really sticked, the message, was in all these IoT communities and IoT meetups all around the world. And um, we got um, uh, a lot of um, a response in the first week. So we got somebody from Sydney, we got somebody from uh, Buenos Aires, we got somebody from Sao Paulo, Manchester, London. So people said that we want to also do this, what you did in Amsterdam in our city. So we created a like, content management system, a community platform for them to create their own uh, communities. And we said, here's our open source code. You can use our brand, you can use our logo, just put your city beneath it. Like it's all open. I mean, you are the network, let's build this thing together and let's do this on a global scale. And um, that was really good. Uh, and uh, it was really nice. We had a lot of enthusiastic people, but they they came back to us and they, uh, they had some, some feedback. So they said, first of all, uh, for instance, the people from Buenos Aires, they said a thousand euros for a gateway Maybe if you compare it to like a mobile uh, 3G uh, 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 tower, it's, it's really, really inexpensive, but for us it's a lot of money. They said 1,000 euros per gateway is too much. Uh, it's not user friendly because you need a, a very skilled technician to install it. And we want to build use cases and examples ourselves uh, in a very easy and developer friendly way. So. There was really, uh, really good feedback, uh, and we decided to 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 take to to take that uh, take the feedback and make sure that the uh, the barrier to entry and the level to entry to to engage in this project was lower. So we uh, joined up with uh, with our partner Tweetoner. It's a project agency from Rotterdam, and we designed a LoRaWAN the Things Network gateway for 200 euro. And we created development boards based on the Arduino form factor and the Arduino programming platform that were connected to the Things Network. So this is the gateway, and this is uh, the Arduino, and there is a LoRaWAN chip on it, and it has the libraries pre-packed. Pre, pre so that was really, really, uh, that resonated really well with our community because they were used to when they were prototyping Arduinos that your Arduino is, is, is connected to your USB cable, and then you're, you do some prototyping, but it's Arduino always stays on your desk. It's a bit boring. It, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with it, but now with this Arduino, you can really disconnect it, put it on a, to a battery, and you can build a, a, a prototype that you actually can use. So um, what we did is we had this growing community so we told this, uh, like, this is our idea. So this is, the pro uh, this is the product, this is the price. If we're gonna bring this to market, are you gonna buy it? So we just did that question. Very lean, lean startup, you know, you might know it. So we already got in, 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 uh, in three weeks, 600 people that said, if you're gonna put this product to market, we're gonna buy it. So that gave us the confidence to do an initial investment in a Kickstarter campaign because that's quite some investment. You have to make a video, you have to do product development, you have to do a lot of research. So we did this, and um, but we, this interest was growing because we had this landing page with people signing up for this Kickstarter campaign. And then uh, last year, the 21st of October, we had this huge group of people that were already interested, and uh, I launched the Kickstarter campaign at the crowdsourcing week the Global Crowdsourcing Week in Brussels on the 21st of uh, October. And we sent all these 600 people a mail and we said, we're gonna put this Kickstarter campaign, this crowdfunding campaign live at two o'clock. But we're only gonna tell the world and the press at three o'clock. So what we asked at two o'clock, please pledge now, because once it's out in the open, if you already have a significant amount of money, you have this social proof, and then you get a snowball effect and probably then you're gonna make your Kickstarter crowdfunding goal. And that's actually what, what happened. So within the first hour before we announced anything, we had 100 people pledging 300 euro each. Um, within a few hours uh, later, we had 40,000. 40, within 24 hours, we had 80,000. 
within uh, uh, the um, eight days, we had our 100% goal of 150,000 euros. And uh, eventually, within uh, 30 days, we had 300,000 euros. And, um, and for us, it was, it, was, it, was, it was very nice, of course, because we, we, we had a successful crowdsourcing campaign. But for us as social entrepreneurs, it was, it was a validation, right? So we're doing something. We created a nice story. It's for the people, by the people, very romantic. I will tweet about it. You're so cool. Okay, very nice. But that doesn't build a real community. But people that are actually investing 300 euros of their personal money to, build a, to buy a product and some prototyping equipment because I believe in something, that's some like really true hard validation. And as a social entrepreneur, by doing something publicly beneficiary, but also trying to build a business, that is very important. And for us, it was really a milestone where we said, okay, we're gonna cut down our existing businesses. So my co-founder had a IT business in, in making sports uh, systems, and I had a small IT app agency with, uh, with four people, and we said, we're gonna stop. We're going to go full focus on this. This is so much validation. This is has so much traction. We're going to go all in. Um, and uh, we had a, a lot of media attention. We were on the 8 o'clock news, a lot of blogs. We won the Internet Society Innovation Award of the Years. These communities, they kept growing. So we, found, uh, we hired some community managers and we had people in the community that wanted to do community management. So it was just growing and growing. And uh, this is a screenshot of all the active communities and people around the world that are building these networks at the moment. And this is just a, yeah, just a few of the people that, uh, it's a pity there's only men. I don't know, trying to get more women on board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there were too many women, <laughs> women in there, but, uh, and um, so, yeah, so um, we're now growing. I did this, we have 100 communities. I think we're already at 150 communities at the moment in 40 countries, already have a thousand members that are actively involved. Some really focused on building the network, others mainly focused on building use case. And um, this one is cool. This is are the guys from Iran. Hello, this is Tehran. Uh, we are the Things Network community here. Uh, we think an open and crowdsourced uh, network can bring this opportunity for innovators uh, to work on the novel ideas uh, around the Internet of Things. For now, we are working on both the gateways and the network backbone. And the first part of the network will be accessible in April. So, join, join us. us. I mean, you can uh, understand the, the amount of joy we're experiencing when we just see like, from all kinds of people from around the world doing this. And I think Iran is a very interesting example. I was, um, I was actually going to visit them last week, but it just lately, the U.S. made some very, very strange laws, which makes it very hard to go to the U.S. once you've been in Iran the uh, last five years. So I, uh, I unfortunately decided not to go there. Uh, they, they just in March implemented a very strange law, which, uh, which prohibited me for to going. And um, uh, so these are guys from Brazil having meetups, doing T-shirts, um, this is in Buenos Aires, so I hope do, don't hope they're gonna get lightning or any thunder storms or something. But y you see, this just they're very active in this. This is in here in Utrecht. We have a very active community, connecting bikes to the internet, connecting cows. This is a very cool project from Japan, where they had a very uh, dramatic nuclear incident there. You you might know in Fu Fukushima. Uh, incident and um, what happened is that the government was lacking in providing proper information about where it's safe to be and where it's not safe to be and they actually were had didn't have any like quality information which resulted in, in them ev evacuating a lot of people from safe areas to very dangerous areas so when the people found out a group of uh, hackers and makers stood up they created uh, radioactivity sensors, strapped them together with GPS uh, modules on their cars and started driving around to gather their information themselves. And they now have a full crowdsourced map of Japan with 
real data about where it's safe and where it's not. And we're working together with them also to connecting these sensors through the Things Network to the, to the internet. This is such a device. This is in Oxford. This is a water uh, a level meter. Citizens place these under the bridges. They measure the water of the canals. This data is fed into a central system and flood uh, uh, alerts are, 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 are uh, uh, flood alerts are, 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 are generated on that. This is a, a, maybe you know these buta gas things. You know, have at a camping site, you just build, get a can of gas. This is the energy equivalent for that for the India market. So you can get a charged battery, take them home, watch TV, do light, and then you can take it back to the shop and replace it. What we're going to do is make this whole system connected. So you have the status of everything. You uh, know what, um, uh, what, uh, what the condition is of batteries, what the energy level is. And if you have more energy and uh, more inf information about your small mar marketplace, yeah, you can act on that. You get, you get a so-called more liquid market yeah, because you can prevent any obstructions in the supply and demand, which is a, which is a huge uh, advantage. You can make very uh, more animal-friendly uh, wildlife trackers. So wildlife trackers now right now is like the size of a, of a rugby ball for these, uh, for these animals. With this, you can make a very small one. Uh, smart, uh, smart parking sensors. Um, yeah, making sure that, for instance, in the city of Amsterdam, they have a lot of cars driving around just searching for a parking lot. It's unsafe. It's dirty. Uh, it's annoying. So this in information about free parking lots will be for something interesting. So, um, yeah, so we, we saw this network. It was a crazy idea. It went through a project. And we decided, because of this validation, to move on as an organization. And what's next? And Johan and I were sitting together, and, 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 and we thought, OK, so, so, so what we're going to do next? What's, are we going to extend the network? Are we focus on the technology? And we decided that the only, thi only reason why it makes sense what we're doing and we're going to ger generate value with this network. And it can be any type of value. And it can be make sure that your uh, environment is more, is, more, is, is, is more pleasant to live in. It can be that I can optimize my processes so I, I have less cost. It can be that I can build new propositions so I can make more profit. It doesn't really matter what kind of value you create. We need to create value. And um, the only way we saw that happening is if we made it very, very, very easy for businesses, for IT integrators to create these applications, right? It's to give them these very usable, very user-friendly APIs to make these applications. What you see in, 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 in technology, for instance, when Apple opened up their iPhone for people to make apps on. They made an easy API, and you had an explosion of IT agencies that jumped on that. Yeah. So once you give them the tools, there will so happen something. So we decided we're going to focus eyes on the price that was the value, and how we're going to do that is making very easy SDKs and APIs, making awesome documentation, and developer consoles to make this uh, happen, and spreading the word. So uh, talking all kinds of events, we had the honor to be selected on South by Southwest, um, uh, which was really nice. Uh, we're now uh, this week talking at uh, the next web, of course, here campus party, which is uh, which is an honor. And um, and we're where we just launched at, uh, the Things Network Labs, and Le Things Network Labs is an extension of our community platform where all the makers on our platform can exchange how they build their use cases. So we're asking the entire community that, that building all these kinds of use cases is to make tutorials on our platform to explain to the, all, to the rest of the community how they did that. So um, that's what we did, a little website. Um, and, um, and next is also uh, coverage. Right, so we sold these thousand gateways around the world. Uh, this is the Netherlands, what it looks like when we're gonna ship in July, August. We're gonna ship these gateways, uh, which is quite, probably like a community network, quite a significant uh, coverage. 
and we're just engaging with all kinds of parties and experiment with all kinds of models how to create this decentralized network. And one of the things what we, what we did is, um, is for the city of Utrecht, we partnered with the Economic Board of Utrecht, Eurofiber, and um, we, we said we're going to kickstart this city with 10 gateways and actually the whole province. So um, we already have two gateways here. So here the network is completely available. And we just uh, yeah, put one on a very, very big radio tower in Lopik. If you're from the Netherlands, you probably know what I mean. It's a very high radio tower. Put one on there. It's probably going to cover a large part of the, of the province. And uh, what we also uh, decided is to make available these development devices. So I've got in this box, I got a 400 of these. And these are these Arduinos. And they have, um, just put it, get it out of the box. And you probably know the Arduino platform. And if not, Google it, it's very easy. And you see this, this, this really so small silver one. That's the LoRa one. Um, uh, 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 module, and that allows this thing to connect to the internet through LoRaWAN. And there are 400 available right now, brought to you by the internet supplier here, Eurofiber, us, the Things Network as organization, and the Economic Board of Utrecht. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to provide them to everybody here that wants to build an application with the Things Network. And um, the only thing what we're going to ask from you in return uh, is to go to the thingsnetwork.org slash labs, so our labs environment. And when you're done, so we will share this with you. We want to ask you to share your use case and what you've built with our community and how you build it and document it in there. And uh, yeah, write a little story about what you built and how you did it so the entire community of the Things Network can benefit from that as well and be inspired how you did this. Um, we are organizing a workshop tomorrow at 9 o'clock uh, by Johan Stocking, my, my, my business partner and tech lead of, uh, of the Things Network himself. Uh, and we're going to have three hours, a complete run through of how you're going to connect this one to the internet. All right. <laughs> And um, so, uh, so make sure you're you're there, um, and um, yeah, how to get started? It's it's pretty easy. Go to the thingsnetwork.org, uh, uh, and and there's all the documentation, the wiki. Um, what's the page again of the the thingsnetwork.org slash campus party? Okay, yes. So if you go to the thingsnetwork.org, toch of niet, Lawrence? Yeah. Slash campus party. Thingsnetwork.org slash campus party. And there's a complete instruction on, uh, on, uh, on how you, how you want to do this. Um, if you want to pick them right now, uh, so uh, uh, Laurens and uh, Ludo from our team, they will, will uh, assist you. Uh, come up, tell us what the idea you have, what plans you have with it, and you can take one uh, home. Uh, I think it's a very nice present from Eurofiber. These are actually now 50 euros in our shop. So be very careful with them and do something cool with them. And we love to see if you can do something in return for our community. So um, thank you very much. And I would love to answer all your questions. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to help you take all those questions. Okay. I, just a quick thing. Because in the Netherlands, once you launched the network, of course, lots of other people also started launching lower networks like KBN. And so, what do you feel about that? Yeah, so um, it's a lower when it's a technology which is just available, like anybody can build a Wi Fi network. And there are also large ISPs that are making these networks, and they do it in a traditional way. They have a large capital investment, and they are going to charge money as uh, for subscriptions. And uh, that's a perfectly fine model where um, they, 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 they make it very easy for corporations to do that. Uh, the only uh, thing is that it, you pay for that, right? So it's, it's quite, uh, quite, um, quite expensive. Um, and also you're not in control of the quality because with the Things Network, you build the network yourself. So if you 
you have a mobile phone. If your mobile phone doesn't work, it's your problem. It's not the ISP's problem. You can call the ISP when once you have, you can call the ISP, but they won't do anything. If you, if you, um, with the things network, have a problem with the network, it can only be your own fault. And that's a good thing because then you can influence the quality, right? And the same thing for us as well, uh, the security model that's now being implemented by ISPs is not end-to-end. -end. So they make it very easy for you to get your data, but it means that it's being decrypted halfway. We offer alternatives to have truly end-to-end -end encryption in IoT, uh, which in our opinion, in some use cases, is critical because you don't want an intermediate party to decrypt, uh, decrypt the content. So that's a bit of the difference. Lots of questions around here. Lo Come on, who, wants who has a question? Go ahead. So, um, is it is is it only one way? So, can you only uh, send? Um, well, my boat is filled with water. Uh, you may do something about, it, or can you press a button and it automatically starts a pump? Yeah, so it goes both way. Uh, the only thing there are some energy consumption limitations, right? So, if you have a, if you have this small device with a small battery, you cannot l not make it listen all the time to the radio tower, right? So, you have to be smart about that. Because the whole idea is that it's long range. Yeah. So, so there th you can make uh, agreements on time slots that you're going to listen. But what you also can do is, um, is that there can be a payload in the acknowledgement. So it now it gets technical. But if you send a message as a note, then it sends back, I received the message. And then you can at attach a little payload with extra data, which can then be used by the by the... By the by the data, but it, it could be. But you have to be, um, you have to really think about your use case and take in account what constraints you're able to um, yeah to follow. More questions? Yes, please. Wait, 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 wait. So we can all hear. Um, um, I'm a lucky one, I think. Uh, I live in Houten, so I'm pretty near the Lopez Tower for okay. uh, connectivity. <laughs> Um, but if I want to develop an application and there is not yet coverage in my area, uh, w is, is anything like that uh, possible, or do yeah, I actually so need um, some kind of? Uh yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, f the first thing is I would say is to buy a gateway, go to a shop or to buy something. 250 euros now in retail. Um, that's one. Um, if you just want to do this as a maker, I would advise you just to buy one with a group. Go to a local maker space. There's, there's, there. I mean, if you go to your local hacker uh, space. So how much space can you cover with one? Uh, ten kilometers in range if you have a high position. So you need some friends that live ten kilometers. But <laughs> I think if you, like, if you just want to play around with it, my advice is go to a local maker space, pitch this idea, say to, let's put in 20, uh, 25 euros each. I think every maker space you will find enough people. Then the next thing is make uh, find a high 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 point, and then yeah you have these now in now, now you can get them with us for free so you're mm -hmm. lucky but then on the you have these prototyping boards they're around 50 euros but it's for make so it's not it's not that much uh, a lot of money. More questions? Yes. Wait 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 wait. I, I was wondering if there are a lot of uh, devices connected to one gateway what happened with the bandwidth yeah so uh, it's a very good question uh, one of the uh, cool things about the frequency that it that LoRaWAN uses it's not completely free so it's free to use but it's not unregulated so um, the reason why it, why the Wi-Fi doesn't work here is because 2.4 gigahertz working it's working now okay so it's at the 2.4 gigahertz where Wi-Fi is on is free so that means you have a so-called strategy of the commons problem. It's a free space, so everyone tries to optimize it for its own use. And because everybody does it, it becomes a mess, and the total quality goes down. Yeah? The 868 megahertz, where we are, where we are on right now, uh, where we are working on, is regulated. So you are only allowed to use a, a certain amount of uh, capacity of that uh, frequency. And that capacity is, 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 is limited in time, right? So um, I'm going to go a bit in depth because uh, depth because we've got still got 15 minutes. So um, if, if we're far away from each other, 
I have to shout to you, yeah, and I have to talk s slowly, right, if we're far away. Otherwise, we cannot hear each other. And the problem with that is that everybody will hear us. So if s somebody else is shouting, we will disrupt each other, right? If we're very close, I can whisper and very talk very fast. Right? And the same goes for this. So th this technology is optimized in that way, but the regulation uh, uh, makes sure that you can not do a lot of this shouting on the long range because you have to take a lot of time to make sure you understand my message. So you're limited by the amount of time that you can shout, right? So that limits the way you can, uh, can use it, but it's a good thing because everyone has that limitation and doesn't become a mess. And then you can un end up with like 10,000, 100,000 of devices using this frequency. And how do we know how much we can send, how so much time we have? That's a problem, that's, uh, that's regulated. Uh, it's also on our wiki. Um, I think we said on an a day, you can only lose 30 seconds. So it's really low. It's really low for threshold application. You should not send every second, it's 21 degrees here. You should send, it's now changed from 20 to 21, right? So you should, should think, really think, think through about these constraints. But if you, if you do that and you, 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 you optimize this client surface architecture with a middleware, uh, uh, with some middleware you can, like you can almost implement ev everything if you just focus on sensor uh, data. Time for three more questions. So one, 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 who wants to? One over there, one over there. Let's start there. That was, was it Felix? Yeah, it's one. Uh, about that uh, gateway thing, uh, it's possible to make uh, a gateway simulator on your laptop and you can just uh, connect uh, your Arduino with uh, USB cable and try to connect to the simulator and uh, you can build up your own app on the Arduino first uh, and try it with uh, connect with the simulator yeah. if it works and then you can uh, bring your Arduino to the to connect with the real gateway. Is it possible to make one? Yeah, it's possible, but um, it's not that cost efficient. So at the moment, I think if you want to buy this, uh, build this yourself, um, uh, that's, that's, I think it will, um, it's possible, but it's hard to get these components. And um, you have to have like a lot of knowledge how to control these chips that build the, the modules that build the gateway. So my advice would be is that it for you it's the most cheapest and fastest way is to buy a very cheap gateway like we, we supply. But um, there are development kits uh, and we, I think the, m the cheapest development kit I know that's exists right now is, twi is 500 euros. That's the twice the amount. So, and we, um, uh, the, the gateway we built is open hardware. Uh, we, we also make the layout such a way that it's it's easy to modify yourself. We added XB interfaces. Um, uh, we made it in such a way that it's easy for you to sort, just remove chips, add chips. Uh, so if you're really a hacker, you can do that. Sorry? Y y we made it in a way that everybody should be able to, to build such a big thing. It will not be the cheapest uh, option, but. Okay, there was a question here, yeah. I was just interested to know what you uh, thought of the waitlist protocol. Yep. The waitlist is uh, the protocol used by Sigfox. Okay. This is Laura. Laura Wen. It's it, it's, uh, it's built by the same uh, um, a chip manufacturer called Semtech, uh, but it's not the same protocol. Okay. Yeah. So it has similar characteristics, but it's it's not it's not waitlist. Let me see. Th you already had one question, so. Just come to check if somebody else wants to ask a question. Over here. And you can have one more later. Uh, first, thanks for the great lecture. Um, I want to ask, uh, you said that it's 250 euros for a gateway, but how much, for example, did you case with the boats? How much will it be for a uh, person that has 100 boats, let's say, to install a sensor on each boat? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question because, because eventually the adoption is, is going to be determined by the low price of these stickers. So we're expecting them that, that now you could make them for 25 euros. 
But it, I mean, the whole industry and the whole alliance and the whole uh, all the manufacturers around this technology know that these have to drop to 10, 5 euros. And then uh, then it's going to start uh, start working. But expect that to, to drop that like within three years. Yeah, so we're now in a we're now in a phase in this technology that our people are actually going to create the products. So they're prototyping, and there's going to be initial use cases with very, very positive business cases. So they're going to try to get a lot of margin out of the market now. And then once these business cases have been matured, then prices are going to drop. Right. So that's in a chip business, it's always over time. It's, it's just... Okay, I, I know there was one last question here. Anybody else still? Yes, John. This is John. Okay, one last, last question. Yeah, very short question. Um, the protocol itself uh, on the gateway, is it open source? It already existed? Is it completely open or is it patented maybe? Um, uh, yes, yeah, so um, the, the, the protocol used called LoRaWAN, that's open. Um, the only the... the uh, how they call the beta versions are closed. Uh, the LoRa uh, modulation technology, so that's the real chips that actually do the modulation, that's uh, a patented uh, proprietary te technology, which for us as a open platform is a bit of a um, Achilles heel, right? So it's one of our weaknesses of things network. And that's why we're moving towards um, a, a radio frequency modulation technology agnostic platform. So we're also implementing Bluetooth. The new uh, 4.2 version of Bluetooth is gonna be way longer range, very battery efficient and also higher bandwidth. So we're gonna include Bluetooth. We'll have a range of around 100 uh, meters. And what we're hoping to see is uh, that there's gonna be uh, available um, uh, within like now in a few years also a uh, open modulation technology because it's it's very it's complicated stuff, but it should be possible. And now you and I know if you heard about software defined radio, uh, software defined radio is actually a generic chip and generic antennas, and you which you can program to create any radio frequency application. So if that becomes a more of a commodity product, you will see that this radio frequency technology, which is now more a hardware business, becomes a software business, and then things become, get disrupted, right? So, so, that's, uh, so that's a bit of the whole, uh, whole story about that. Okay, I had one question for you and two questions for you guys. The first one is, um, I mean, the boat use case, of course, is like a PR use case, right? Yeah. It's, it's a it's lovely a use it's case. A story, yeah. um, undoubtedly, you and your friends are trying all trying out all kinds of use cases. Yeah. What is the thing that you yourself personally actually use? I mean, what use case is in your life? In my life. So the technology is not far enough so to to have like real life use cases. And um, what I what I think is uh, or there's I think two things are the most interesting. One of the use cases is that it, um, the way we do it, and we build ground up networks and ground up use cases, that it enables the citizens of people to get information they, uh, they would, uh, would otherwise not have. So it demo democratizes. Yeah, yeah, but, but a, an example, a so really that, that specific example. Th that example would be, I think the most interesting example is the Japan example, where the government is lacking in information, also not willing to give yeah. information, actually yeah, yeah, exactly. deliberately is not withholding their information for 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 personal concerns, and then yeah. you have have it. So that's that's interesting. And on the other thing, what I think is really interesting is uh, is a use case where uh, in places where there's no internet at all. So, um, for instance, making a water well cell the entire region, what's the status of a water well in Africa? So it will save you a walk to the, water, the yeah. wrong water well. So these, these really, really massive business cases behind these kind of use cases where there's no internet, I think that's the most inspiring. And, um, and for making money, it's, 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 
it's putting sensors in underground garbage containers so we don't send uh, uh, yeah, garbage trucks to man, uh, yeah. uh, but it's not inspiring <laughs> uh, so what I would I would, would well. I, and and what I, th I think um, um, like if you're gonna build use cases just to go further yeah. on your question uh, I always like this is a hackathon right this is no this is not a business it would don't be lean like do something that makes you laugh do something that will feel somebody's pain S do something that feels good in your stomach and that's what a hackathon is about a hackathon is not being lean not be make have any big business sense do something funny do something good something that feels good i think that's what you should do during a hackathon and don't Make a lot of use of your rational brain. Okay. That would okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. So two questions for you guys. The first one is, who thinks, okay, we should have a things network in my local community, and I should be the one to start organize this? <laughs> hey, come on. Uh, uh, okay. Ah, so, great. so where is that? Just just some regions or cities. Where where would that be? Xinjiang, China. Ah. Where, where is that? Taiwan. Taiwan. Ah, nice. Where, where else? Yes. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> Who else? Who else? One here? Teal. Teal needs one. We absolutely. need Teal. And Bill Povert couldn't miss it for the world. Yes. Lisa. Yeah, of course. Well, Lisa. Yes. The, the, this, the Bob uh, country, so to speak. And Middleburg. Yeah. Oh, we're going to the regions of the Netherlands now. Yeah, Anyb yeah, anybody nice. in the international still wants to add a network? Yes, over there. Where? I can't hear. Can, can somebody reach out? Where would that be? The, uh, we <laughs> she needs a microphone. Yeah, no, no, not this one. And I heard Bogota over there as well. Eh? Which one is it? Okay. In Brazil, you said. Ah, nice. Uh, yeah, we're already in South Paulo. At least we've got all the continents. No, the, yeah. the second question, of course, is much more important. Who wants one of these? Yeah. Okay, come and get them. Come and get them. But Thank uh, you very much. Yeah, come <laughs> over and uh, Ludo yeah. and Lawrence come over as well. And um, 